Hi, welcome to the Fit and Healthy Today Show. And today's subject is asthma. It's a serious respiratory disease that leaves its victims breathless. And it's not because a good looking guy or a good looking girl is walking by, you just can't breathe. There's a lot of symptoms that are associated with asthma other than just being breathless, unable to get in that oxygen and breath including difficulty breathing. You're, you can get a wheezing sound. So when you take a deep breath, you can hear kind of a wheezing. Continual coughing, like you're trying to get your breath. Tightness in the chest. Increased mucus flow. You try to cough up more gunk and stuff. Uh, and because you don't have as much oxygen and you're trying to breathe and you're coughing, uh, you get oftentimes a, a loss of sleep or an increased rate or heart rate. You get a constriction of the bronchial muscles is what occurs with asthma. And when the bronchial muscles constrict, the airflow and the air can't get in, it tightens, it spasms, and you cannot breathe. It often caused by a buildup of mucus or an inflammatory issue of the mucus linings. There can be various triggers associated with um, asthma, and there are various, and sometimes there are multiple reasons, or sometimes there's just one cause. Um, oftentimes we get athletes who never are asthmatic any other time other than when they're performing their athletic events. And they'll wheeze and they'll cough and they'll have a hard time breathing. Um, the root causes that we find that are most common, allergies, be them food or environmental causes, pollution and irritants, the things that we inhale, uh, chlorine, uh, gas fumes, whatever it be, pesticides, chemicals, irritate the lungs and <gasps> cause the, uh, the uh, mucus linings or the uh, bronchial tubes to constrict. Uh, respiratory infections, cold and flu. I have a lot of people who may not have asthma other than when they get a cold, flu, virus, or, or uh, infection in their upper respiratory system. Cold air causes the constriction of the, uh, of the bronchial muscles. Physical exertion, we talked about with exercise. Hormone imbalances, believe it or not, uh, can cause an issue because the more stressed out you are or having emotional distress, which we've had a whole other uh, uh, lecture on, can cause um, muscle tissues and vasoconstriction, which in turn causes the bronchial muscles, the bronchial lining, the mucus to increase and it constrict out. Diet is very, very important uh, when you're talking about uh, asthma and examining, particularly in childhood asthma, getting to the bottom of food allergies, either through blood work for food allergies or through the little skin prick test for environmental allergies. Or if you know mom's allergic to that, chances are a child is gonna be allergic to that. Kind of ruling out or eliminating foods that can be triggers is very, very important. Most people that have asthma, if they stick to a simple light diet that's based on whole grain foods, uh, raw vegetables and fruits, uh, seeds, fish, greens, a good old diet, you know, that's not full of processed foods and chemicals is the best road for an asthmatic to take. Carotenoids, rich in antioxidants and anti-inflammatories, so including vegetables that include dark green leafy vegetables, broccoli, leafy greens, kale, uh, deep yellow, your squashes, orange vegetables, squashes and carrots. Those types of uh, vegetables are not only alkali producing, which enable the body to utilize oxygen better, but they help oxygenate and reduce inflammation. Uh, there's one study that was conducted, just one simple study of, uh, of a group of uh, individuals, I think there were a hundred and some people in the study, and they found that even eating fish once a week, once a week and hopefully uncontaminated sources, reduce the risk of as an asthmatic attack by one third. So we're gonna talk more about fish supplements and, and other supplements that can address or reduce or get rid of asthmatic reactions and responses, provided you can get rid of some of the triggers and the root causes. Garlic and onions. Uh, one of my customers, she's from the Appalachians, and her mom used to make this onion syrup whenever they got colds or were asthmatic. It has something in it called quercetin, which is very anti-inflammatory, helps allergic reactions and respiratory health. 
Water every two hours. If you don't have adequate amounts of liquid, water, uh, particularly water, juices as well, but things that aren't caffeine sources, because remember caffeine sources make you lose water. But water helps make that mucus in the lungs, and this goes for whether you have a cold or the flu or asthma. It loosens it up so it's easier for the body to get out, for the little cilia to move all that gunk out of your, out of your lungs and your upper respiratory. Uh, ground flax seeds, as far as diet is concerned. Uh, anything that's rich in omega-3s. We talked about the fish study. Well, flax seeds or flaxseed oil are another source or alternative source of getting those omega-3 fats, which are very anti-inflammatory, and we'll talk about it further when we talk about the supplements. Foods to avoid. Ah, naturally, we're going to avoid foods that trigger an allergic reaction. Sugar, junk food, fried, refined foods, these all make the blood very, very acidic. When you're acidic, it robs the body of oxygen. Oh, guess what? You're trying to breathe, you can't get the oxygen, good luck. Dairy, food with preservatives, particularly these preservatives seem to have the most triggers in asthmatics. Yellow dye number five, red dye, particularly red dye number 40. Sulfites, um, lunch meats full of the uh, uh, sodium nitrates. Oh, man, rob the body of oxygen. Benzinates. And then, of course, MSG, which is a flavor enhancer that's in just about any processed food that you buy, unless it says on the outside, no MSG or no analyzed yeast. Frozen or cold foods. So if you can eat a lot of cold foods or ice cream, huh, makes the body cold. Remember I talked about when you get cold, you get bronchoconstriction? Well, when you eat cold foods, you also get bronchoconstriction. So avoiding colder foods and eating foods that are more warm or heated. Um, NSAIDs, and those are anti-inflammatory drugs, including naproxen, aspirin, uh, ibuprofen. Two-thirds of drug-related asthma is caused by these NSAIDs. Of all the thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of drugs out there, the NSAIDs are two-thirds responsible for drug-related asthma induced, with aspirin accounting for one half. So the aspirin a day to thin the blood that the doc recommends could be triggering your asthma. So if you're an asthmatic, that's something that you need to evaluate and discuss with your doctor. Supplements. I've came across so many studies and so many different supplements that are helpful for asthma, but I'm going to list the ones that I found most common and that I know that my customers come in and I've seen the best results at our stores uh, that we have. Essential fatty acids, you know how we talked about the flaxseed and the fish oils and the reduction of asthmatic response? A tablespoon of flax or four to uh, 8,000 milligrams or four to eight grams of fish oil, it's very anti-inflammatory. Now when we're talking about anti-inflammatory, we're talking about it produces anti-inflammatory prostaglandins. And these, if it's anti-inflammatory in your asthma, it's gonna be anti-inflammatory in your joints, other places on the vascular system. So this is one more place where fish oils, flax oil, and omega-3s come into play to reduce inflammation because the key is we want to, with asthma, reduce inflammation. A good multiple of high MB vitamins help you deal with both physiological and emotional stress that oftentimes trigger asthma. Particularly, I see that a lot with children. They'll get that, they get all excited and the bronchial constriction. The B vitamins help you deal physiologically with those physical and emotional stresses. Magnesium relaxes bronchial tubes and literally, if taken, can stop an acute attack. So I know in our stores we have an ionic magnesium. You take it, boom, you get almost immediate absorption. It's a liquid ionic. But magnesium citrate forms, uh, aspartate, uh, those types of forms, not an oxide. I see a lot of doctors recommending oxide and I want to scream. Very poor absorption. But the plant sources, ionic sources, will give you much better relief uh, in magnesium. And you can take that on a daily basis, not only for asthma, but obviously for blood pressure and other issues because it relaxes the vascular flow. Ester C protects the lung tissues because remember, the lung tissues are very expandable, collagen rich tissues. So the Ester C helps with that collagen matrix and is also an antihistamine. What they found out is people who had asthmatic triggers before they worked out, if they did 2,000 milligrams, of a fizzy C drink or some very absorbable um, uh, mineral ascorbate or ester C, 
In workout, they suffered, and I should have said on here, 50% suffered fewer symptoms in asthmatic. 50%. For, so for all of you Olympic track runners out there that are training in Solvain or Santa Maria or Lompoc, hit the vitamin C, particularly the ester C sources, if you've got asthma to prevent those triggers during your workout. Kirsten and bromelain. We use this a lot in allergy season to help cut back on allergies because it helps with mast cell production, reduces, well, antihistamine or antihistaminic. Um, but what it does basically is you're going to do 500 milligrams of each of them, preferably on an empty stomach, reducing that inflammation and helping with those allergic responses. Zinc lozenges. What's interesting is anything in the mouth and the tongue um, absorbs really readily into the bloodstream. And oftentimes what they found is just by doing a zinc lozenge, sucking on a zinc lozenge, you can stop or shorten the duration. 50 milligrams, boom, right in the mouth, uh, can stop or shorten the duration of an asthma attack. A lot of these things are quick, fast magnesium, zinc, C. These are quick, fast ways for prevention and if you're in the middle of an attack to help you with an attack. Obviously, uh, you know, if you've got a bronchial dilator, use whatever you can to stop it. But boy, if you can prevent that asthma attack from ever occurring, hopefully then you don't have to use your steroidal uh, inhaler. And boy, particularly with children, those inhalers, and I know my one younger son, when he was younger, used to use them, and I got him all off of it and no longer asthmatic because we did what I've got down here. Um, they really make the kids hyper, and so as best you can, if you can do other sources. Um, plus, the steroidals really bring down the immune system, uh, other issues, bone building, mm, all those issues are affected by steroidals. Um, antioxidant formulas um, in A, C, zinc, selenium, all those types of antioxidants, once again, help with inflammation and decrease inflammation because they're antioxidant. They um, take the rust and they neutralize the effect of rust and things that rob the body of oxygen and neutralize them. Full spectrum enzymes. You, know, you kind of scratch your head and you kind of think, what does a digestive enzyme have to do with asthma? Well, number one, poor absorption of nutrients. Number two, inadequate amounts of stomach acids not only contribute to poor uh, um, absorption of nutrients, but inflammation. Uh, there was one study out on using something called betaine hydrochloride because most people lack stomach enzyme or lack stomach acids. They don't have too much. There's very few of those that have that issue, and that's a subject for another day. Um, but having adequate amounts of these enzymes break the food down, help you utilize the nutrients, and help with the pH in the stomach as well, so you can be less inflamed. Lycopene. Another study, boy, lots of good studies. Lycopene uh, studied an awful lot for being anti-prostate cancer. Also found half of the people with exercise-induced asthma, another exercised one, 30 milligrams once a day for one week, 50% of them had a reduction in their asthmatic triggers or their asthmatic uh, uh, attacks during exercise. Simple, basic, inexpensive types of things that can be done versus using the bronchial dilator. Cordyceps. Um, they help reduce bronchial secretions and increase lung function. It's kind of funny. I have uh, some of my older customers that come in, and some of them, a couple of them got, went off to Peru. And I use cordyceps because I do high-altitude um, uh, marathons. I enjoy doing those. And, and it, you know, when you're in sea level like we are here in, in the valley, or close to it, and you get to seven or 8,000 feet, oh, you're trying to pull in oxygen. Well, the cordyceps have found, and, and the Chinese athletes in one of the Olympics a couple of decades ago, they were all running better, faster, and everything, and they couldn't figure out the reason why. Cordyceps really aid the ability to utilize oxygen, and these older customers that I talked about that went to Peru, and we're talking 60s and 70s, that normally get altitude sickness, no symptoms. They had the guides asking them to give them their leftover cordyceps so they could use them for their um, people that were trying to hike in these higher 10,000 and above uh, areas in the Andes Mountains in uh, Peru. Homeopathy. There are specific homeopathic remedies. And what you can do, you can either go online or you can look up in a book. I think going online is great. And you can, or, or homeopathic doctor is actually always the best. But you can list a series of symptoms, and there's particular homeopathics that can match those symptoms 
depending on what your issues are with asthmatic attacks. I know in our stores, we have one book that we can refer to and open up and I can say, okay, what are your symptoms? What sounds the most like? I can go over to my homeopathic counter, pull off that homeopathic, they can take it under the tongue and get some relief. Very quick, fast remedy, and homeopathics are probably one of the most successful ways to deal with allergies as well. Um, go online and research a little bit more about homeopathy. It's been around hmm, longer than modern American medicine. How's that? Or actually, it was the first modern American medicine other than herbs. Uh, pycnogenol, very, very anti-inflammatory. Actually, there was a recent article written by a physician about it being very effective. I know in my stores, I've, I've sold almost a dozen pycnogenols just this last week for arthritis. But pycnogenol also helps with inflammation pertaining to uh, asthma. Greens, we talked about greens in the diet, but there are some super green foods that you can intake. Spirulina, I'm gonna say it right here, spirulina, corella, Anything that's a superfood green helps oxygenate. We use this for COPD patients, asthma. If people aren't good vegetable green eaters, come in, you can grab them in pill form, you can grab them in powder form, whatever it is. But these super greens alkali the blood and they oxygenate so that you can breathe better. And if you're an athlete like I am, you can perform better and breathe better. I used to have a little bronchial dilator. Absolutely, and so did my uh, younger son. And when I would go out on my athletic events, uh, particularly climbing, I lived in Phoenix at the time, my uh, inhaler went with me until I learned these key tips about reducing my asthmatic response and alkaline the blood. Super greens, simple, easy, food sources. You can mix them outright, take them in pills. But if I have to stress anything, get your vegetables, alkali your blood, look at your diet. I'm hoping this gave you some good basic information on what to address for asthma. Research some more on your own. And like I said, there was a tons more research. I could, have, I could have spent a couple hours on this lecture, but hey, I only got 19 or 20 minutes. So anyway, we're gonna be moving on to the next portion of our show, which is the fitness portion. Thank you. Welcome to the fitness portion of our show. And today, rather than moving and grooving, I want to talk a little bit about diet and the timing of eating when you're trying or starting a weight loss program. Number one, don't eat carbohydrates late at night. So a good protein with a salad, otherwise your body doesn't have time to use those calories. Second tip, spread out your meals, three to 400 calories, at a meal, five meals, nice small meals. That way all you're gonna do is you're gonna fill your liver glycogen supply up and you're not gonna store it as fat. Sec that was the second tip. Third tip, when you eat food, eat a balance of proteins, carbohydrates, and fats. And boy, I sure hope, maybe I have to do a definition of carbohydrates. It's sugar, white flour, pasta, starches. Vegetables are the good source of, uh, and fruits are the good sources of carbohydrates. So for example, a sample breakfast, a nice small bowl of oatmeal, a couple of scrambled eggs, okay, with maybe some, a uh, 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 couple of nuts or a little bit of nuts, almonds on the side. So we've got fats, proteins, and carbohydrates. A lunch might be an open-faced sandwich with meat, avocados, that type of thing, to where basically you can get a good balance of food, but not an overabundance of calories. And then a dinner, a nice dinner, some source of protein with like a nice salad. And then some snacks in between like nuts and fruits, a combination like that, or a protein shake. Spread out your meals, don't eat carbs late at night. If, though, if I could give you any hint as far as diet is concerned, that would be, those would be the biggest hints to help you drop off the weight. Next, we're gonna be moving on to the research portion of our show. Thank you. Hi, 
Hi, welcome to the research portion of our show, and with us today is Ralph Torciano. Ralph? And thank you for the intro. Well, here it goes again, another interesting food item that seems to be extremely effective against serious diseases such as leukemia. Now, this food item is already tested to be effective against cancer cell lines in skin, breast, colon, lung, stomach, and prostate cancer. This supplement or food item was grape seed extract. Not grapefruit, but grape, well, not grapefruit, but grape seed. In fact, this study that just came out of the University of Kentucky, they found that within 24 hours, 76% of leukemia cells had died after being exposed to the extract. How did they die? They died through a process called apoptosis, meaning the cells just basically committed suicide. In addition to that, they found that it worked with regulating a protein called JNK. If you want to research it, just remember junk, take the U out. They also discovered too, that what they were looking for is an agent that was effective on cancer cells, but leaves normal cells alone. And this shows that grape seed extract fits that criteria. In addition, did they use any special form of grape seed extract or any sort of medically filtered or pharmaceutical grade? No. They use commercially available grape seed extract, which you can find in the market or just about any health food store. And they said too, it does not affect normal cells, which is a plus. They don't know why that happens, but it does not. After that, a good strong one for antioxidants. Now your antioxidants like vitamin C and vitamin E and vitamin A that sometimes get some bad press. But however, in this case, they found when it came to chronic pancreatitis, which was no known medication to relieve the pain from chronic pancreatitis, otherwise known as CP, they found it was effective at reducing that pain and reducing the levels of oxidative stress in patients with chronic pancreatitis. This was in the new study of gastroenterology, as far as what's out there. In fact, it was twice the rate over just placebo, or just mind power alone. Furthermore, 32% of the patients after three months with chronic pancreatitis taking antioxidants became totally pain-free. They basically also said too, as a side note of how it worked, the fact that measures of oxidative stress were actually increased slightly after taking the antioxidants, then decreased significantly afterwards. They suggest that this state of heightened free radical mediated injury and chronic pancreatitis that basically prevented also gave the opportunity that maybe that this injury is reversible. Again, this came out of the Journal of Gastroenterology and also reported in the Journal of American Gastroenterological Association Institute, otherwise known as AJA. I just wanted to get that information because it's important. AGA. After this, diabetes. Atkins. Remember when they shot him down for a long period of time and trying to recommend low-carb diets for diabetic patients? Well, Duke University Medical Center researchers found out the low-carb worked very well. In fact, this is what they discovered. They said, quote, we found you can get a three-fold improvement in type 2 diabetes as evidenced by a standard test of the amount of sugar in the blood. Now, ready for this? That wasn't the good part. The good part was this. Diabetic medications were reduced or eliminated, eliminated in 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 percent? No, eliminated in 95 percent of the low carbohydrate volunteers, compared to 62 percent just doing low glycemic index. The low carbohydrate diet also resulted in greater reduction in weight. That's a strong plus for the low carbohydrate diet. It is not just about calories when it comes to diabetes. It is about how that food treats the pancreas and causes that production of insulin or your sugars to go up. Low carb proves that there's a correlation between your diet and that disease. Now we go back to the attack phase. Now a long time ago, we've been very much adamantly against some of these biophosphonates. These biophosphonates often go by the name of things like Fosfamax, Symboniva, and other type of medications like that. Reason being, because we really haven't seen any credible scientific reason for its use. Now here's another reason to basically question it or bring it up to your doctor. University of Southern California School of Dentistry and also reported in the Journal of American Dental Association, otherwise known as JADA. And also too, 
Keep in mind, Fosamax is the 21st most prescribed drug in the, in the world. They found out that a small percentage of patients, 9 out of 10, take an oral form of biophosphonates, the ones you take by mouth, for any length of time, developed osteonecrosis, meaning your jawbone begins to melt away. So the way they said basically, we have been told that the risk of oral biophosphonates is negligible, but 4% of the people taking it just after any length of time is not negligible, he said. So most doctors who prescribe biophosphonates have not told patients about any oral health risk associated with the use of these drugs, despite even short-term usage opposing a risk due to the drug's tenacious 10-year half-life in bone tissue, meaning 10-year half-life after taking Fosfamax for a short period of time, staying in your body. And patients that develop necrosis after going off, it took as long as a year to heal. Real important, special for dentistry and a beginning to voice concerns from the other side of the aisle. After that, number five, vaccine policy. Sometimes what happens, it needs to be challenged from time to time. Well, the researchers in Switzerland and the United Kingdom did, especially to the pneumonia vaccine. When they looked at 22 clinical trials with 100,000 participants in North America, India, Africa, Latin America, and in the Caribbean, when they looked at the high quality trials, they said, quote, there was no evidence that the pneumonia vaccine can prevent pneumonia. Therefore, Policymakers may therefore want to reconsider their current recommendations for that vaccine, especially where routine macaco conjugatic immunization has been introduced, concluded Dr. Matthias Eger of the University of Bern of Switzerland and their co-authors. Something to really consider, especially when it comes to vaccines. Why endure the risk with zero benefit, regardless of public policy or propaganda issues? After that, we go to the serious condition of autism in the state of California. Research at UC Davis often were told that the only reason autism rates are increasing in the state of California is either one, by immigration, or two, better diagnosis, or three, the inclusion of more mild forms of autism in basically these studies. Well, they discovered, and it's also published in the January 2009 issue of Journal of Epidemiology, that that is not the case. They said it is time to start looking at the environmental culprits responsible for the remarkable increase in autism in the rate of California. We're talking basically multiple, multiple cases where it used to be 9 in 10,000, now to 44 in 10,000. What they're pleading for is financial aid and looking at the environmental reasons. They say all the money is going to genetic reasons, when in reality they know now it's environmental and they need to rechange that funding around. Well, thank you very much. Gosh. Wow. Thank you very much, Ralph. It's very, very appreciated. Thank you very much for joining our show. And we hope once again that this helps encourage you to do further research for yourself and for your health. Thank you.